Today, we're joined by Dr. Bill Maurice, our regular uh, CEO and president of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. And we have a special guest, Susan Van Meter, who is the president of the American Clinical Laboratory Association. Susan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm uh, sure that most people within the laboratory industry know you, but I'd love to hear from you. And maybe you could describe exactly what your role is and what you oversee with ACLA. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pritt, for inviting me to join today. Uh, we here at ACLA are all fans of the pod, so it's uh, terrific Excellent. to have the chance to join you both this morning. So thank you. So the American Clinical Laboratory Association, as, as most folks know, do represent the nation's leading clinical laboratories. We're privileged for the opportunity to represent Mayo Clinic laboratories, as well as a large commercial laboratories such as LabCorp, Quest, uh, BioReference, Sonic, ARUP, and many other laboratories, uh, Exact Sciences, Neogenomics. Uh, so we have about 40 laboratories in total in our membership. We also have an associate membership category that's very important to our work. These are principal principally diagnostic manufacturers, so IVD companies like Roche, Abbott, Siemens, Cepheid, et cetera. Uh, so we uh, are able to bring to our work, which is developing and advancing policy to extend the reach of testing, supporting and fostering innovation, whether that be for improved policies and reimbursement, so coding, coverage, and payment, or in the regulatory environment, if that's CLIA, or as you've talked about so many times on the pod, uh, what is the role for FDA? What will that be in the aftermath of valid not making it over the finish line? So really our work again is focused on supporting clinical laboratory members to help extend that reach of testing. Because the work that you all do is so absolutely critically important to improving and saving lives. Well, thank you, Susan, as is the work that you do. It's very important. And Bill, uh, thank you for joining us as always uh, <laughs> for our regular discussion. And I understand that you've been working with Susan for quite some time. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the I'm the itch you can't scratch or whatever. I just keep throwing <laughs> up. You can't get rid of me. But this is a dermatology podcast. It's a lab one. So, no, I've had the privilege of uh, serving as the uh, chair of the board of the American Clinical Laboratory Association for a, a, the past three years or so now, um, and was led the search committee that was successful in, in bringing Susan to our organization, which has been a, a significant step forward for us. Um, so yeah, Susan bears the same kind of battle scars that you do, Bobby, you had to work <laughs> with me on a regular basis, but it's been a real, it's been a real privilege. And I, I you know, we came together, um, Susan joined our organization really at the height, I would say, at the sustained peak of COVID testing, um, has been a very important um, advocate for our entire for our profession. I'm um, just even our industry and our profession um, in terms of trying to illustrate how important we are to healthcare, how that needs to be recognized by policymakers in Washington D.C. and elsewhere, um, because we really are. Um, you know, the, a foundational element of healthcare in this country and really bringing in the perspective of not just for laboratories, but for people. And the fact that access to testing is important for people in a hospital, it's important for people in communities across this country. Um, and so uh, so really it's critical that the decisions that we that are made around our, that Susan touched on are made through the lens of its importance for healthcare and importance for equity of healthcare access. Yeah, well, you know, this is the perfect time to be talking about all of this because we're right in the middle of lab week and we're celebrating the role of the lab. So it's great having you both on. And, um, you know, I'll start with you, Susan, giving, giving your unique perspective as the head of ACLA. What are your thoughts on the view of the role that laboratory staff play in patient care? Well, thanks for the question, because it is so critically important, as Bill was saying, to making sure that we're thinking very concretely uh, and urging policymakers to extend the reach of testing, because it is so absolutely foundational to inform clinical care. As, as we all know, there's a statistic that indicates that about 70% of clinical decisions are made using results from clinical laboratories. That is an astounding statistic and really speaks to the importance of the work, uh, importance of, the work of laboratory professionals. And I've, I've had the opportunity uh, to travel around the country and visit with ACLA members. And uh, I am fascinated and in awe by the work that laboratory professionals are doing every day um, and the dedication of it. I've had numerous conversations with various laboratory professionals and each conversation all comes back to reflections on the importance of that work every day 
to, again, improving and saving lives for patients. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we're going to be communicating uh, this week during Laboratory Professionals Week is helping policymakers understand really just how important uh, the work of laboratorians is every single day to day-to-day -day healthcare, and then healthcare in the time of emergencies, as Bill reflected on about COVID and MPOX. Yep. Yeah, all such important issues. And Bill, you have your dual roles as ACLA chair and also president and CEO of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. Any additional thoughts on this topic? Well, I mean, as you've worked with me for you know a long time, Bobby, and you, Susan, more recently. I mean, my my one of my things I've been really passionate about throughout my career is just the visibility of our profession, right? And it, the recognition of how important we are. And you know, one thing, I, Susan, I know you have a rich background even beyond the diagnostic manufacturing, but going back to your time with the New York State Hospital Association, which of course is extraordinary, really represents the gamut of when you think about what, you know, what you represented. Maybe you could just speak a little bit more to the importance of laboratorians really opening up their labs op and being much more to increase their visibility. Just, you know, you've been in many different facets of, of healthcare and now you're here and just speak to the importance of laboratorians really I don't want to say trumpeting, but really being thinking about the fact that we have to be out there for people to really understand what we do. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So I started my career in DC working for CMS and then spent, as, as you noted, uh, many years working for the New York State Hospital Association. And, you know, New York is a great microcosm of the country because you have critical access hospitals and then you have the second largest public uh, health system uh, outside of LA, actually, and a lot of academic medical centers, great community hospitals, uh, and then the work with diagnostics manufacturers. So I've had the privilege of seeing uh, from various perspectives um, how that healthcare delivery system um, influences uh, patient access um, and then also how policy policymakers think about it. And, you know, we've talked many times, I'm sure in various settings, all of us about how COVID generated an opportunity for the American public and for policymakers to understand much more concretely the role of clinical laboratories. And we really have to take advantage of that because it is often the case that there is a greater spotlight on other providers, on other aspects of the healthcare delivery system. So a key priority for us under Bill's leadership as chair of ACLA is to do work to really emphasize and clarify for policymakers what is the role of clinical laboratories and how without clinical laboratories, you can't really have a functioning healthcare delivery system that is informed and uh, to the betterment of patients. It's, it's absolutely critical. It's keystone. So uh, one of the things that we're undertaking at ACLA this year is as a brand new campaign, we call it the Power of Knowing campaign. And every month we feature uh, one or two uh, diseases about which clinical laboratory testing is, is really critical for screening, diagnosing, determining the right treatment pathway, monitoring treatment for patients. Uh, this month we're celebrating laboratorians as part of Power of Knowing. But I mention it because that campaign is focused squarely on policymakers within the Beltway. So members of Congress and their staff, staff at HHS, CMS, and other agencies inside the Beltway. And I'll give you one quick brand new statistic um, from this advertising inside the Beltway. Um, and you can see it on our social media channels. Just this last month, we've noted that there have been about 600 individuals from Capitol Hill and from HHS that have clicked on the ads, you know, followed through to learn a little bit more. Mm. It's a great start for us. And we're going to continue that campaign so that uh, ultimately we'd like to have it be the case that every policy discussion around healthcare has reflections about the importance of the role of clinical labs and laboratorians. Yeah, that's outstanding, Susan. We've definitely learned that we have to speak up for ourselves and all that we can do, uh, you know, Bill and I do this podcast every week. Uh, we're on social media. The campaigns you're doing are so important. We have to keep this momentum going from what we've been able to gain during COVID. Absolutely. And Bill, I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that. Well, uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> I have additional <laughs> thoughts on everything, but whether or not their value is always a question. But no, I, I think that... Um, you know, as Susan and you were talking, the thing that I reflected on is, you know, the fact that, that, and Susan, you talked about your experience, that there are many different voices in laboratory medicine. There's many different voices, even in our association. 
the most important thing is for not only for us to reach out outside of the laboratory, but as we think about our labs as, ourselves as laboratory professionals, let's think about the, that, that entirety of that community holistically, right? That to think about academic labs, um, you know, reference laboratories like Mayo Clinic laboratories, private labs like exact sciences, they have many, many things in common. They really have the same purpose, and that is to create information that's useful for patients and society. So I think that that's one thing that we really need to focus on. You and I have talked about this a lot, Susan. It's also been in this, the discussion we've had with other uh, leaders from others in our association at, our, at the board levels. How do we create more of a singular voice around laboratories? Because the reality is it is difficult for people to understand. Um, they tried, and there was a lot of, we were all on the press very much during the pandemic with just news outlets and others wanting to understand testing. But now as the pandemic passes, you know, people are looking to other things, even in, especially with policymakers, as you noted, Susan. So I just think it's important for all of us to think about ourselves as a community, think about the things that bind us together uh, as laboratory professionals this week and not thinking about, well, that's, you know, that's Mayo Clinic Labs, that's a, that's a reference lab and I'm an academic lab or I'm a private lab. And that's, you know, really to think about the fact of the matter that we're all laboratory professionals. We are all delivering healthcare in this country. And as Susan has really emphasized with many influential people within the Beltway, within in Washington, D.C., um, we are a critical element of the healthcare delivery system in this country, not just not just standing up for a pandemic, although we're doing a lot with that as well. Um, and maybe, Susan, that, you know, as we pivot a little bit, you know, you mentioned MPOX. Maybe we could just talk a little bit more about your experience with that, you know, and reinforcing why we have to continue to be advocates so that the lessons that we learned very with great difficulty during COVID are not lost. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about this subject because there are very concrete lessons that we learned. I would say that one of the core lessons is the absolutely essential nature of public-private collaboration, both through COVID and through MPOX. And I have, I have to thank you both for the work that Mayo Clinic Laboratories did to actually step in along with four other ACLA members uh, to support the US government's response to MPOX, right? So uh, last spring, we knew that we were beginning to see cases. Our colleagues who do tremendous work in the public health uh, laboratory ecosystem were supporting testing, uh, but it was very clear that there needed to be a substantial augmentation of testing capacity. So thanks to the five ACLA members who jumped in and worked very collaboratively uh, with CMS, CDC, FDA, the White House National uh, Security Council that helped lead uh, the response efforts. That was essential, truly. Um, and that's a key lesson that we need to take forward, right? How do we make sure that those public-private collaborations and arrangements that we know provide such benefit are made concrete so that we don't lose any time before the next pathogen of concern arises. So uh, one of the things that ACLA has worked on is a joint report that we co-wrote with the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Uh, one of my co-authors is uh, Dr. Tom Inglesby, who many of you know um, because he served in the White House COVID response team uh, under the Biden administration, and he's been a terrific leader. And we provide therein about a dozen concrete recommendations for how we can, again, make concrete this public-private partnership, including through the establishment of a board or forum where our vision is you'd have leaders at the decision-making level from all key federal agencies, uh, as well as from key players in the diagnostic testing ecosystem, uh, manufacturers, obviously clinical laboratories, distributors. Uh, we really think that's essential in order to have that continuity of conversation to be as prepared as we can. And thanks to Bill, Bill was one of the uh, leaders that we interviewed to develop that report. And, and I'll just say a last comment there whether we were interviewing individuals from CDC or FDA or from manufacturers or clinical laboratories, there is really great alignment and consensus around the fact that we know there are key steps that have to be made uh, to make concrete, again, those public-private partnerships. So, Bill, thanks for your collaboration on that work. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure. Bobby, you were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say how important all of this is, because when we've been uh, dealing with a pandemic and outbreaks, 
we have to recognize that this is not going to stop. And as a microbiologist specifically, okay. we know that with our changing world and um, for a number of different reasons, including the ease of global travel, encroachment into natural areas, contact with animals, the CDC and World Health Organization are indicating that we are gonna to continue to see outbreaks. And that's gonna be with emerging pathogens, re-emerging pathogens, we're actually facing right now an outbreak of drug resistance. Uh, it's actually its own pandemic across the world. So yeah. we need to continue to take the lessons we've learned and then go forward and apply that to what we're going to be seeing in the future, because it's going to be every few years, we're probably going to have these new challenges. But if we've really learned from what we've been through together, hopefully we have some good tools now in our toolbox and working with um, ACLA, uh, working with these private public partnerships, working with the CDC and FDA and, and coming up with a rhythm of how to address these, it's gonna be essential going forward to being smooth and, and, and maybe not like it was in the early days of the pandemic when we were really kind of struggling. I yeah. couldn't agree more. I think that's very well said. And just to, you know, put my advocacy hat on uh, for a second to make it a little bit more concrete about mm -hmm. um, this work. Um, Congress has until September 30th of this year to reauthorize a program called the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act. Every five years, they reauthorize this. So this really is a critical time for us to weigh in with members in the House and in the Senate to talk about these concrete recommendations we've put forward and to encourage them to update the law to make sure that there are those institutional arrangements and flexible policies and the investment is made uh, to ensure that we are as prepared as we know that we can be for that next pathogen. So Susan, for our listeners, are there things that uh, we should encourage everyone to do in terms of advocacy, talking to their representatives to help support this type of legislation? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, thank you. Well, uh, we do have our concrete recommendations uh, and letters to the House and to the Senate available on our website, acla.com. Uh, so we certainly encourage folks to reach out to us and we can help you uh, find the right way to weigh in with your member of Congress and their staff. Um, and in addition to working on preparedness issues, there are some reimbursement issues that we are advocating on uh, that are quite to laboratories across the country. And I'd love to mention those as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Please. Great. Okay. So right now under current law, we're living under PAMA, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, which was intended to base Medicare rates for the clinical lab fee schedule on commercial rates. So rates that commercial insurers pay to clinical laboratories. Unfortunately, when CMS collected those data to determine Medicare rates, it was only data from about 1% of laboratories across the country uh, that had the negative effect of reducing rates significantly below where Congress had originally originally intended them for, to be. Uh, so we are working uh, to correct that. There's been four times that Congress has stepped in uh, to delay reductions or delay data reporting. We have legislation that has been introduced in the House and the Senate by a great group of bipartisan leaders. It's called the Saving Access to Laboratory Services Act, or SALSA. SALSA would correct that data collection and allow for greater predictability of reimbursement under Medicare. And that's really essential, right? So that you all have that sense of understanding what rates will look like in the future allows you for, to plan better, to innovate, uh, it creates better stability. And as we think about how important, just to sort of tie in other aspects of our conversation, clinical laboratories are, you know, we talk with Congress about this is essential to pass SAL uh, SALSA to ensure patient access to services, uh, to protect that infrastructure that's so important for day-to-day -day care and in times of emergency, and to ensure that clinical laboratories have the resources to be able to innovate, right? Um, testing, again, as we talked about, improves and saves lives. The more innovation that can happen, the better we can work to detect earlier uh, diseases and to work to facilitate increasingly personalized medicine for patients. So those three aspects, access, infrastructure, and innovation are really core to our advocacy. Uh, and our advocacy campaign around salsa is called Stop Lab Cuts. And if you'd like to learn more uh, and to partner with us, you can visit stoplabcuts.org. And we have a lot of advocacy resources, including tools that allow you to take action and send messages directly to your members of Congress, asking them to co-sponsor and pass this important legislation. 
Well, Susan, this is so great and so timely because here we are in Lab Week, Laboratory Professionals Week, and we're celebrating what we do, but we also have to think about protecting the laboratory care that we provide to our patients. And so this is a perfect time to talk about the advocacy, something that Bill and I talk about weekly, actually, of what we need to be doing as a profession to support our patients. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> Well, I know that we're just about out of time, and I just wanted to uh, open it up to both of you to see if you have any last words that you'd like to uh, leave for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll step in and then you give you the last, last word, Susan. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, thinking back as you're talking, it's when in the, in the crucible of the early days of the pandemic, many different groups came together. That's You were still with Avamed at that time, and we were talking more than we ever had before. Um, and it, it really, you felt the traction that we got around issues like reimbursement that you just, that you just spoke to. Um, now, as we move past, you know, the health and public health emergency, I think is going to be declared us over by the time when we're listening to this or having this conversation. So, and our listeners are listening, we have to make sure that we take that spirit of talking together and working together and carry that through without the pressure of the pandemic, because that's really the best way for us to get visibility around things like we need our profession to be recognized and to be sustainable through policies around reimbursement and other things. And so, I mean, maybe that as, a, you know, given your experience across healthcare, maybe we can just end there in terms of now, you you know, with your strong leadership of ACLA, you know, what, how our listeners should be thinking about ha maintaining the kind of conversations and visibility we got with the pandemic. I think that's hugely important. I mean, any time in advocacy that you can collaborate with stakeholders that have similar interest, you raise your voice and you are heard much more clearly uh, by members of Congress and other policymakers. So I think now is exactly such a time. If we are talking about salsa or pandemic preparedness or whatever the issue might be, the more that we can continue close collaboration with our partners throughout the provider community, whether that's working with the American Hospital Association, the Association of American Medical Colleges, the IDSA, CAP, AACC, NILA, so many other terrific partners in this ecosystem, um, as well as thinking about manufacturers. Bill, you mentioned manufacturers. They are great associate members of ours. They've been strong partners on salsa and on other key issues. And then we also really have to think, too, about the absolute importance of patient organizations and consumer groups. We've had the good fortune last year for about 36 patient and consumer organizations to indicate their support of SALSA. I think that was enormously helpful in having members on both sides of the aisle recognize the importance of ensuring that SALSA moves forward to protect the work that clinical laboratorians, that laboratory professionals do every single day. So if, if I could just sort of round out with one final comment, it's really just to thank all of you um, for the work all laboratory and professionals are doing every day to protect all Americans. And so hats off to you this Laboratory Professionals Week. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. And what an inspirational way to end. Uh, yeah, I want to wish everyone a happy lab week and thank you for joining us today. And Susan, a special thanks to you as our guest. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you on with us today. Oh, it was my privilege. Thank you both so very much. Thank you.